Mom, stop that. <laughs> Why should I? You started it. All right, kids, cut that out. Look out of the windows. What do you see? Just a bunch of old houses. Okay, now, which one is the oldest? I don't know. How do you tell? That's what you're going to find out. I'm Mary Hafer, curator of the Bedford Historical Society. The purpose of this video is twofold. First of all, to point out the truly rare architectural heritage of Bedford, Massachusetts. And second, to enable passers-by to recognize the different styles and periods of architecture as they drive through the New England countryside or small villages. Bedford has, on original foundations, nearly all of the buildings of a bustling early 19th century small manufacturing community. It is the real thing. There are other outdoor village museums that have been created by picking up old houses and putting them together in a new location. But here, they are still in their same places. If one of the young men who lost his life in the Civil War were to be reincarnated right here today, he would not be disoriented. He would know where he is. How, how did this come about? Well, it was a matter of boom and bust. In colonial times, Bedford was a farming community and it consisted, like most other New England villages, of scattered farmhouses, a church centrally located, a minister's home, and a minister's farm near the church because the ministers in those early days had to farm to support themselves as well as to preach. Bedford also had a small crossroads with a couple of inns and taverns, and this was to become important later on in its economic boom. Bedford has a few really old houses. The two rooms on the right side of this one have construction details that date from the first half of the 1600s. There is a keeping room downstairs and a chamber above it, as they were called. The overhang that you can see on the side of this house is a holdover, which provided a refuge in English houses from the contents of chamber pots, which were routinely and normally flung out of second story windows. Here is another one with a 17th century overhang. The rear lean-to or salt box roof on this one has been raised for more headroom. The generation of optimistic and energetic young people who grew up following the Revolutionary War changed this from a farming community into a bustling small manufacturing center and a stagecoach stop. Federal and then Greek Revival houses popped up like mushrooms to house the workmen and their families, as well as the entrepreneurs. These three on the common were probably all built by Joshua Page. The one on the left has its federal character concealed by later Victorian additions. The center house was typical of the two-family double houses built to house workmen. The one on the right also was a two-family house, and it might be called Greek Revival. Notice the back roof chimneys. These are another clue to simple Federal and Greek Revival houses. They allowed more useful headroom in the third floor than the massive old center chimneys. Elbridge Bacon lived in this simple two-family house which still shows many of its original features. A man named Nathaniel Cutler moved to Bedford 
and began building Greek revival houses with the gable end facing the street. They are dotted all over Bedford. Here is a particularly charming example. This house belonged to Isaac and Lydia Pinkham, and she brewed her famous vegetable compound here before moving to Lynn. Notice the nice little lunette windows in the gable. They are a particularly nice feature of this house. Here is one that fooled me. I thought this was a nice Victorian house, but it isn't. It's older. It has lovely Victorian doorway and bay windows. Now, let's go to Lexington and talk about how the boom began. This is Lexington, Massachusetts. The road out from Arlington, Cambridge, and Boston comes in that direction. The road to Concord is in that direction. You've all heard the story of Paul Revere's ride. When Paul came to Lexington to warn John Hancock and Sam Adams that the British were coming, he met young Dr. Prescott here, and they galloped on their horses off to Concord, where there was a big patch of arms stored. And that is off in that direction. At the same time, Nathan Monroe and Benjamin Tidd, who had met them and gotten the word here in Lexington, went galloping down that road, which goes to Bedford. Let's go now to the Job Lane House, where we will meet Mr. Maximilian Farrow, an architect who specializes in historic architecture and is an authority on that subject. Ah, oh, William. Virginia, how are you? Hi, I understand fine. you want to learn all about old houses. Yep. Well, this is a great place to start. This is one of the oldest houses in town. And you know, we're very lucky in this part of the country. Most parts of the country don't have anything this old. What strikes you as interesting about this house? Well, it's um, facing away from the road. Well, that's right, it is. But you see, this wasn't really a road back when this house was built. It was just a little track that meandered out here, so it wasn't important. What was really important was keeping warm in those terrible, terrible winters. So, which way do you suppose you'd face a house in order to stay warm in those horrible winters? Um, south. Exactly, exactly. You'd face the house dead south, and this house faces absolutely dead south. And that way you'd get as much sun as you possibly could into those really pretty small windows, you know. You had to get do the best you could. What do you think is interesting about this house as opposed to, say, the house in which you live today? What's unusual well, about it? Well, it's made of wood. Absolutely. That was what people had around here, was a lot of wood. They didn't have to worry about buying any wood, let me tell you. Uh, but is it all made out of the same kind of wood? Um, no. no. On, on the sides, it's different. Exactly. Now, those are called shingles on the side, and these are clapboards on the front. These people didn't have any fancy tools like we have today. They had just an axe and a few wedges. So they had to take that big long log and they had to use wedges all in a row and then they'd put more wedges about an inch away and they'd split it like the sections of an orange. But that took long, long time to do. It was much easier to make the shingles, you see, because you could just cut up your log in 16 inch pieces and then you took something that was uh, just like a wedge with a handle on it. And you banged it with a wooden mallet. And each time you did that, whoom, you just knocked the shingle off. And wow. that was easy to do. So they only put the clapboards where you first see the house to make it look impressive. And the shingles are the real skin everywhere else. Mm -hmm. Wow. What else is interesting? Well, I noticed that the windows over there are higher up than the, wind the two windows. That's a very important thing to notice because what it tells you, of course, is that the house wasn't all built at one time. Imagine these people, they'd just come from Europe, they arrived in the fall because it took all year to come across the ocean, and they had to live in Boston and just wait for their chance to get some land. But when they got that land, you see, they had to grow crops on it that first year or they wouldn't survive the first winter. So as far as a house was concerned, they'd just build one room. And in this particular case, of course, they built a room like that, and they made do with that until their fields were more prosperous and they could afford to worry. Then they could build on more house eventually, perhaps a generation later. 
So which is the first half of the house? Probably that half. Why do you suppose it's probably that half? Because they had to have a door. Exactly. And the window above the door is at the same elevation as the two over there. Superb! So. Absolutely excellent. That's exactly why you know that that's the original part of the house. And of course when they built onto the house, they built on this way, wrapping the chimney completely inside the house. Why would they want to do that? So it would be in the center of the house. Exactly. Why would you suppose they'd want it in the center? So it would give the whole house more heat. Exactly. That was the most important thing, was to get all that heat into the house. That's why the chimney is so big. Okay, let's look at, for a second at this shape of the house over here on the side. Now, what do you see that's unusual about the shape, Virginia? The roof on the front has a shorter slant than going down the back. You're absolutely right. Now. That's called a salt box. And the reason that that looks like that is that we said first they built one room, then they built another room, and then they still wanted more space, but they couldn't go on building a long house like a caterpillar. So they simply put a shed on the back and lengthened the back so they had room for a kitchen. Let's go around and look at the back and there's a really nice little surprise there. Now, what's the surprise? The um, roof is in two different segments. That's right. You see, this confirms what we knew already. Now, what is the difference? The roof on that part is higher up. So higher up. So taller. what happens if the roof is higher up? They get more room. Exactly. You have more room for your head. It's a little nicer place to be. And is the house all nice and neat and straight? Look at this wall, no. for instance, over there. Bows right out, right? Old houses get tired, you know? It's like people. You can tell if a person's old from a distance because he doesn't walk very straight. You know, he walks with a limp and so on. Same with houses. Very often, I find that just when the house comes into sight half a mile away, that's when you can best tell if it's old or not. Well, I think we should look at a a little younger house than this, not, you know, I mean, a couple of hundred years, you know, not real young like you are, but we should see how architecture changes over the years and why. Well, kids, here we are. Now we've traveled about 130 years in time, and we're looking at a very, very different house. How does it strike you, Virginia? What's different about it? It's more elegant. It has more trim and Beautiful. fancy stuff. Beautiful. It's much more elegant. This is the house of the most important person in Bedford when it was built. Who do you suppose that would have been? The mayor. Well, we didn't have mayors yet in those days. In fact, Bedford still doesn't have a mayor. It has selectmen. But who else do you suppose might have been really important in an old revolutionary period house? The priest. Yes, the minister. The minister was the most important person in town. Well, you said this is fancier. Now, what are some of the things that make it fancy? Well, it has all that trim around. Exactly. It has wonderful trim. Now, you remember I told you that these houses were built by the people here. They were just farmers. How might they have known what a classical doorway looked like? That's a really <laughs> tough question. If you wanted to know what something looks like, what would you do? I'd uh, look in a book. You'd look in a book. Now, what do you suppose this is telling us about the people who built in this house? This house, They were able to look in a book. Look in a book. You see, the other people had only one book, the Bible, the people we saw before. But these people now had some books about architecture architecture and in fact the first book about architecture is where that door comes from it was a book by an, uh, an Englishman by the name of Batty Langley and Batty Langley published his book is 1750 so right away we know that nobody would have known what that door looked like before 1750, 1750 right so there we have it now Classical architecture is architecture using shapes that were used by Romans and Greeks. Now, Romans and Greeks never, never built out of wood. 
What did they build out of? Stone. Stone. What does the doorway look like it's made of? Stone. Stone. What do the corners of the house look like they're made of? Stone. But actually they're made of? Plaster. Wood. wood. It's all wood, but it's wood made to look like stone so you could go in and feel that you were a little Greek. What are some of the other things that strike you about the detail of the house? Well, it has um, two chimneys instead of one. Wonderful. It has two chimneys instead of one. Now, you remember that with the other house, the chimney was in the middle to keep warm, right? So if you had walked in that door, and I know we didn't do that, but what would you have seen in front of you? A chimney. A chimney. So you would have been in a tight little space with a great big chimney in front of you. Now, if we walk into an elegant house, what do we really expect to see? Space. A front space, hall. Space. A front hall. What's in the front hall? Nothing. Nothing. Oh, usually there's... Stairs. Stairs going up to the second floor. Grand stairs so that when you have a wedding, you can come down in your gown and come down these beautiful stairs. So if you've got a chimney in the middle of the house, you can't do that. You can't have a hallway. So by now, people have become sophisticated enough that they want to split their chimney in two pieces, move it over to make room for this wonderful hallway with the wonderful stairs in the middle. Do you see those little things just under the roof? Mm -hmm. Do they serve any practical purpose? No. No, they're just a little decoration. I don't know if you could possibly imagine what they might look like to you if you've seen them for the first time. Here they are. What do they look like? Teeth. <laughs> teeth. And so they're called dentals, which is the Latin word for teeth. So we have teeth along the roof. We have wonderful fake stone blocks at the corners, which are called coins. Now, you may think it doesn't look like a coin, but if you're French, the word coin is coin, and it means corners. So then we understand why we have coins. And you see that the windows, everywhere you look, the windows, the door, everything is beautifully carved and molded with profile planes. Now, what about the spacing of everything here? It's symmetrical. It's completely symmetrical. In fact, it was the classical peoples who invented symmetry. So you have symmet symmetry around a middle axis that runs right through the middle of the door. And if you were to take a measurement from the middle of the door to one corner, it would be exactly the same measurement as from the middle of the door to the other corner. Now tell me something. Do you think this house was built in several bits and pieces? No. No, it looks like it was all done at once. Now let's walk up to the house and see some of the really nice things up close. Interestingly enough, when we're up close, some of the things that we see surprise us. Look at the clapboards, for instance. You see how wavy and snaky and uneven they are? That's because they're still being made exactly the way they were made on the other house. No one yet here is sawing clapboards yet. That's a new technology. What we have here are riven clapboards split like the sections of an orange, just like in the other house. So it's not technology that separates this house from the other. It was made the same way. It's money. But it's money. That's right. It's the fact you could put a lot more hours into building this house than you could put into the other one. See that over the top of the little pediment? Yeah. You know what that's for. Flag holder. A flag holder. Because by now, people were pretty proud. And there's no better way to show your pride than to put out a flag. In fact, by the time this house was built, we already had an American flag. This house was built in the 1780s when America was already fighting for its independence. Well, kids, here we are. Now we're going to meet Bedford's first merchant. Now, this is really a wonderful house. And interestingly enough, if you were English, that last house was named after the English king, the style of that last house. George was, was king when that house was built, and so we call it a Georgian house. Now, interestingly enough, if you were English and you looked at this house, you would say, this is a Georgian house. But by this time, we didn't have a king anymore. So we didn't like to call architectural styles after a person that we, in fact, felt rather a lot of ill will towards. 
So we call this federal because we were now a federal republic, you see. But anyway, this is still within the Georgian idiom, which, as we've said at the other house, was really determined by classical architecture and particularly Roman classical architecture. However, what do you think, Virginia? How does this differ from the other house we just saw? Well, I see it's got four chimneys, I think. You're absolutely right. It's got four chimneys. What would that tell you right away? They, um, it's prob they probably they Each have chimney too hard. must be one big yeah. room. Well, so right away we've got four important rooms instead of just maybe two important rooms, right? Mm -hmm. Now, what about the fact that the end of the house is made of a different material? Bricks. Now, bricks, of course, by this time were being made by the brick maker down the street. So you didn't have to make a big fuss. You could go and buy them. But you see that the chimneys now are not inside the house anymore. They're towards the side. They're on the side of the house. And if you were going to build all those big chimneys, which take up quite a bit of space as they spread and come down to become fireplaces, then you might as well make a bigger build. house. Exactly. You might as well make the ends brick. The front and back are still wood, but the ends are now brick because they're really just the fireplaces made bigger. But what's the difference as you look at the house? Is it still symmetrical? Yeah. Yeah, it's still symmetrical because it's still Georgian. What about the front door? It's got more windows. Wow. And That's right. The front door has got a glorious amount of glass. What would that do to the inside? Make it br lighter. Much brighter. You see, the stair hall here is going to be even more magnificent than the one we saw because it's going to be full of sunlight. And notice that the window above the door is curved. That's very beautiful. And that's one of the ways we know that this is what we call a federal house. Now, can you tell me anything about the roof? It's flat. Well, actually, it isn't flat, but that's it. You can't see it. The Renaissance Italians, the Italians who were imitating the Romans, had fairly low pitch roofs because it never snowed. This house was built right after the beginning of the 19th century, and everybody was trying to get these flat roofs. They all leaked. And by 20 years later, nobody was building this kind of a roof anymore because it's not suited to our climate. But nevertheless, it's really interesting because we can look at the house and say, this had to be built within that crazy period of time when people were more concerned with the way that a house looked than they were with whether or not the rain came in. Look at the pilasters, which are the columns that are square on both sides of that doorway. See how fancy all that decoration is? They were so concerned with symmetry in Rome that they said, we can't have a capital that looks different from the front and from the side. So they simply turned the little volutes so they're at 45 degrees, so that if that were a whole column, it would look exactly the same from all four sides. Okay, I think that that sort of covers everything that we want to know about this particular house. And I think now, we are going to get the biggest surprise of all because we are going to see a real revolution in American architecture. So let's stroll away and see what happens when the life in America changes completely and forever. Well, kids, I promised you something really different, and I think here we have it. Now, this is a revolution in architecture and it was the product of a revolution. All the people of Europe who were fed up with Napoleon and the wars and armies marching through their backyards started to come to America because this was a place where everybody could be equal. So they started to look for an architectural expression of equality. What we have here is an architecture of egalitarianism. The idea that here is a man, in this particular case he was not a farmer, uh, this is quite a great Greek Revival house, but he was not an important man. He was not the, the parson. He was not the, the, uh, the local politician. He was a man who 
made shoes. And he has built himself a temple. He's saying to us, it doesn't matter who you are, but your home is your temple. You're as good as anybody else. And so we've turned away from all that elegant architecture that we looked at before, which was, it was really elegant, but it was really, after all, square houses decorated with doodads, right? Whereas here, the house itself is like a piece of sculpture, isn't it? What strikes you about it? What do you like about this house? I like the columns. Exactly. You like the columns. The columns are imposing. You go up to the house, to go up to the front door, you've got to go through those big columns that sort of look down at you. But when you look at the rest of the house, it's just white boards. These houses were all painted white. So here we have someone trying to imitate a marble temple. Now, if you look at this house, the door is on what we call the gable end. Now, why is that? Because in temples, you always entered from the gable end. Now, interestingly enough, if you look at the house and you compare, say, this house to that house or to the house across the street, this isn't any bigger. As a matter of fact, it's smaller than the, than the last house we were discussing, that great big federal house. Uh, it doesn't have brick sides. It's not nearly as expensive to build. But what it really does have is a great feeling of dignity, a great feeling of the person wishing you to know that he is important in the general scheme of things, not because he's different, but because everyone is important in the general scheme of things. Now look at the door for a second and compare this door in your own minds to the door that we just saw. It has some things that are similar and some things that are very different. Remember that great curved window. window? Now, why do you suppose in a Greek building you might not have a curved window? Well, because Greeks didn't have it. Because Greeks didn't have it. Greeks did not have the arch. The Romans invented the arch. And therefore, in a Roman-inspired building, you had curves. But in a Greek-inspired building, there are no curves. Just big, heavy beams. Look at the windows and the doors. Notice that the corner has something that you didn't see before. We call that a corner block. And that's a way that you always recognize Greek Revival architecture. You'll always find... See, if now if you look at the front door, you see that there are great big corner blocks. And then there are little corner blocks where the door jams go up and meet. See, all of that is Greek Revival. And notice that the door has a little motif with corner blocks cut into it. And then the little side lights below have the same little motif with corner blocks. But what's really important here is that this is not a shy house. This is a house that's really bold. And this is the beginning of what we call the American idea of rugged individualism. The spirit that eventually brought us to the West Coast the spirit of the Old West, the spirit of the Cowboys, the idea that every man counts. And from here you get the philosophy that we call manifest destiny, i.e. we are going to do things our way and nobody had better stand in our way. This is where it all began and without this spirit we'd still be 13 colonies on the eastern shore because we would never have had the courage to strike out on those wagons and conquer this immense continent. Well, this is our last stop of the day, main stop, and we're looking at a house that you're immediately going to tell me is so different from everything else we've seen that it's absolutely amazing. Do you think the person who built this house had fun? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he had a lot of fun. Well, I'm going to tell you something about this house. It's an unusual house here in Bedford because Bedford really was not an important industrial town. If we were in a big industrial center, we'd see a lot of houses like this. We call this the Queen Anne Revival. The way I like to explain it to people is to say that the Queen Anne Revival is the first architecture in America built by inherited money. 
the first architecture that was built by kids who didn't have to earn the money that it cost to build these rather fanciful houses. So they could have a good time spending their parents' money, you see. Yeah. And what this was all about was an architecture of optimism. What's that motif inside the little end of the porch? Do you recognize? It's a sun. It's a sun. What's the sun doing? Rising. It's rising. Absolutely. It's a rising sun. Now, what symbolism would a rising sun have? A new day. A new day. Wonderful. Well, that's exactly what that sun is supposed to mean. The people who built this house felt that America was just blossoming. It was at the beginning of a new day, a day of incredible wealth and, and industrial uh, exuberance and uh, production, productivity, uh, shorter work hours, uh, wonderful gizmos that went bump in the night. For these few years between uh, 1876 and about 1903, we had this culmination of what we call Victorian architecture, this, this wonderful outpouring of sh the sheer joy of living. And that's what that's all about. You see, one of the things that these kids like to do, and kids unfortunately have liked that to do in every generation, these kids like to shock their parents. They wanted to mm, thumb their nose at their parents a little bit. So, you know, Daddy was used to the kind of houses that we see elsewhere in town, the sort of houses we were seeing all morning. And these kids said, what if I did a house that was full of things that you don't do? Like having the wall go in and out and in and out. Or having the material change, clapboard on the bottom, shingles with little points on them, shingles without points, more clapboards, more shingles, more clapboards, more pointy shingles, and yet more shingles. See, a person from another generation would have looked and said, these crazy kids, what do they think they're doing? This is outrageous. And the two kids would have been up on the porch saying, hey, 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 hey. <laughs> we got their goat, didn't we? <laughs> And that's what that architecture was all about. Max has given us a good insight into the perspective of history on American architecture. But now I think I'll tell you a little bit about the specifics in Bedford. In 1837, there was a great nationwide depression, and Bedford never really recovered. Uh, when the nation as a whole began to recover, the shoe industry moved to such places as Lynn and Haverhill, where there was water power, cheap immigrant labor, and railroads to move the finished products. But uh, the tanners and the leather workers went along with them. There was just nothing left in Bedford but agriculture. And in the 1840s, the Irish suffered their terrible potato famine and had to come to this country to seek any kind of labor that they could. Quite a few worked on the Fitchburg branch of the railroad, but when that was finished, they moved into Bedford and settled there. They had to take any kind of work they could. They worked as agricultural laborers, as domestic servants, and they worked in the paper mill. When that paper mill burned, Bedford actually lost 10% of its total population. And uh, it was this poverty which is responsible for having saved the old architecture. There was no need for new housing and no money to build it. And after the Civil War, things were really bad. And a Dr. William Hayden, who had come to town, spe spearheaded the petition to the legislature for access to the railroad. And it was not until after 1874 that the Middlesex Central Railroad finally arrived in Bedford. And then there was the beginning of a new de demand for new housing. Commuting to Boston became really easy, uh, probably even easier than it is today. It took 47 minutes to get into downtown Boston, and there were 11 trains into Boston and 13 coming out of Boston every single workday. This made it both a charming place to come for a summer resort 
or to live and commute and work in Boston. Dr. Hayden was quite an entrepreneur as well as a medical doctor and he developed a small spa that was just sort of struggling along with several different interesting springs of water and he developed this into a big resort. He built a fancy hotel like some many of the old Victorian great white mammoth hotels and uh, people could come out from Boston or from anywhere and take the waters in the various little spring houses which were fanciful. He also had his New York pharmaceutical company manufacturing uh, various and sundry patent medicines there and that building still stands. It, today it's condominiums. But uh, people could come out of Boston and uh, live in these nice little commuting houses that were springing up. And these were not wealthy people. They were people who worked for a living. Uh, there were really no inherited fortunes in Bedford at that time. But the balloon frame method of architecture enabled ordinary middle class people to follow the lead of the wealthy and live in quite different and innovative houses. So commuters who worked in Boston lived in these nice new little houses that were within easy walking distance of the new railroad station. Following World War II, Bedford again became a post-war, and again it enjoyed a post-war boom. New churches, new schools, and absolutely thousands of new houses have been built here. This time, it was caused by the electronics industry that grew out of radar and other electronics work that had been done at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology during the war. This boom has also stopped growing. We wonder what will happen next. And here are our kids, the kids who will build the 21st century, and they're having a lot of fun in this whimsical, playground, this wonderful vision of a return to a magic that has been missing perhaps in the austere years of the modern movement. We don't know what these kids will give us for architecture, but we look forward to finding out and whatever it will be, it will be a wonderful sequel to all of this history that has gone before. Mary, it was wonderful the other day to drive around Bedford and see all this interesting architecture. But you know, it's only when you actually get inside these buildings that you begin to really appreciate what the past was like. Yes, I think that's one of the things that the children enjoy going through the Job Lane house, which is where we are today. We're in the upstairs uh, chamber, the hall chamber, where the owner of the house, Deacon Job Lane, and his wife would have slept. Let's look at this room that we're in. This, this house was built in the early 18th century, as you said, for a well-to-do uh, resident of the town. Um, and this is the only room now, all these years later, that still maintains the essence of its original character. Three of the walls are simply bare plaster, we can see the whole structure of the room. We can see the beams that support the house. It's a rather rough and ready structure with these flared posts, which are supporting girts coming in from different directions. And the girts aren't quite on the same level because they were rather afraid in these times that if they put the two uh, tenons 
where they would intersect, that that would weaken the intersection. It turned out not to be true, but it was just a sort of fear that they had. Look at how simple the details are. Look at this board and batten door. Nothing more than a couple of boards held together by some battens, which are just simply boards going the other way. The whole thing is banged together with nails. One board is wider than the other. As simple as can be. And in fact, doors like this are still being made by farmers because it's the easiest way to make a door. If we had to make a door with just a hammer and nails, that's probably the door we'd make today. The fireplace wall traditionally had wood in it to make it warmer. It was really pretty cold in these houses in winter. In fact, on a cold winter's day, you'd be really lucky to get 50 degrees indoors. Now, as we walk through this house, of course, the beauty of it will be to see how the house changed over a couple of hundred years. Here we have the main door into the room, and it's no better than the door we were looking at in the little closet. It, too, is just a board and batten door, simple as can be, still made of two boards. One of them now is a little wider than in the case of that little narrow door before. In terms of a latch to get into this room, the latch is just nothing more than a bar of iron that the smith pounded flat on both ends so you could nail it to the door. Very, very simple way of making a handle. Well, let's go and look at the rest of the house, Mary, and see how American architecture changed to suit different lifestyles. Well, here we are in, in uh, the room directly under the one we were just in, and uh, we're looking at something totally different. Uh, 60 years have gone by. Of course, the room existed, uh, as we know, uh, but it's been redecorated because things have changed. The, the, the life of, uh, of the lanes uh, has uh, taken a turn for the better, perhaps. And look at how much more elegant now this paneling is than what we saw upstairs. We have essentially paneling that is now uh, contained in both dimension. We call this raised field paneling, so that each particular element of this panel is made of some horizontal pieces called rails, some vertical pieces called styles, and in between those are these beautiful panels that are set in. Now, how do we know that this room wasn't always like that? Well, of course, for one thing, we know that this kind of beautiful paneling was very, very rare in the early period when this house was built. But if we just look over here, where I've removed some plasters some years ago, lo and behold, this is exactly the same finished paneling that is upstairs. Uh, it's the uh, long vertical boards. In fact, some child long ago scratched the kind of design that children still like onto the paneling. And we see here the marks of the lath that was nailed roughly on this. And these were the lath nails that we see the mark of. And I removed this plaster to show that this room once looked exactly like the room upstairs. But by the 1770s, people were a little better off and they wanted to feel the classicism that entered their lives. And a classical thing can't just be vertical, it has to be symmetrical. So you want the beautiful panels that have four sides and that divide the whole fireplace wall into this nice kind of rectangular uh, composition. Well, not only did the paneling change, uh, but later on, and we'll talk about that in a minute, of course, the mantle as well changed. This is not the original mantle of the 1770 remodeling, because if we look carefully, we see that this fireplace used to be much bigger. And if we look at the other side, we will see again that the fireplace came out to here. So this is yet another remodeling that we'll talk about later. But this nice chair rail that, that prevents damage to the wall, to the plaster, is part of the 1770s remodeling. And instead of those board and batten doors that were so rough and ready, we now see that the doors have undergone the same transformation as the paneling. They're now also made up of styles and rails with loose panels set in. 
And in fact, there are four panels that look just absolutely lovely, leading some people to call this a Holy Cross door because in fact it does form a perfect uh, Roman cross. So we've gone quite a long way since just three short generations before, but we have to remember that the people who lived in such a house still lived a life that was almost unimaginably difficult by our standards today. They were certainly not consumers. In fact, virtually everything they owned, they made. Well, we've already progressed tremendously in three generations, but this family was to do much, much better. So let's move on and see where they went to next. And now we begin to see English gentile taste per meet American life. This is a mantle. Uh, it's uh, no longer just a matter of, of uh, uh, paneling the wall, but we have an elegant piece of woodwork, a piece of furniture, if you will, that is attached to the wall, uh, and it's in the style of Robert Adam, the great uh, English architect of the 1770s. Um, very delicate, very light, with a mantel shelf. Now, mantel shelf wouldn't be much use to you if you didn't own anything to put on it. And that's exactly what the intent was, to put your beautiful shiny new candlesticks and your lovely new things on the mantel. So this is more of a consumerist society that we're looking at now. And I think if we look at some of the furniture that goes very well with this room, it's in the right period. If we look at a chair like this. This is now a decorated chair. Look at that lovely painting. It's, it's a typical chair of the 1820s. And because of the fact that there is this search for elegance, white plaster walls are no longer good enough. And in a middle-class house by now, we have not only papers, very beautiful, delicate papers. This is a paper in the French taste with these wonderful little designs that are still being emulated today. And of course, a paper like this always had a border. And it's just lovely to see the difference between this very sophisticated environment that we have now compared to what we've just been looking at a few minutes ago. Well, I think that Having seen this, I think we should close with the pièce de résistance for this house, which was, of course, their new parlor. Ah, hello, here we are. We've met again in the very fine parlor, built again in the 1820s. But the great surprise here, of course, are the magnificent murals. Uh, these are murals by Rufus Porter, who was the most important and most celebrated American muralist. Unfortunately, uh, these were covered by wallpaper in later years, and the wallpaper took away a great deal of the paint when it was pulled down. But Rufus Porter was one of the most interesting people in American history, and he was, of course, perhaps best known as the founder of Scientific American. In one way, you can always tell Rufus Porter murals is that he was so keen on the latest technological things that he just couldn't help but slip in a steamboat in every corner of his scenes. Now, what's very unusual about this Rufus Porter, uh, which is very recognizable with his grasses and bushes and trees which are sponged on, is the fact that this is a, what was called a nocturne, uh, a night scene. Most unusual, only about 5% of his work are night scenes. Well, Mary, here we are in the room that gets remodeled the most. Of course, this is one of the rare ones that hasn't been remodeled. What can you tell us about this? Well, one? look at the neat brick oven uh, with a nice little door. And right behind your hand is a peel for reaching, reaching bread. Uh, yes, yes, in, in, a, in and out of the uh, And it takes, uh, I must say, the sort of muscles that most uh, American housewives today don't have. This is uh, iron and it weighs uh, quite a bit even before the bread. Fireplace tools are interesting. This is, of course, a toaster. And uh, you put it up to the fire and toasted two sides, sides of two slices of bread. And then when you wanted the other sides done, you just flipped, flipped right it over. right over. Splendid. And uh, made nice toast. And then here is a reflector oven, which also was good for baking uh, when you weren't going to use that kind of oven, right. but for roasting the meat. And here is the spit, which turned the meat. Uh, and you've heard the expression, done to a turn. Exactly. And this was a job of some small boy or some small girl to keep turning the meat. And then uh, there is a P 
peephole here so that you can uh, oops, see if it's done. See if it's done. And there is also a spout uh, here at the bottom for, for the pouring grease, off yes. the for pouring Making off the, the meat gravy. juices. Right. Right. And then there are a couple of hooks here so you could hang it up on the wall when, when you weren't using it. Well, what about uh, this marvelous uh, implement next to your leg? Oh, yes, this is a wonderful churn, and this is another job that children would have had. This, this is a different from many. Many churns went up and down, but this one went back and forth. And, of course, the job of the children was to make the cream into butter. Many of our most wonderful foods, like butter, were derived not so much from an interest uh, in, uh, in, it, in their remarkably good taste, but from the necessity to put the dairy product into a form where spoilage was retarded. Um, thank goodness for spoilage. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Here's another gem from the old days. Uh, candles were an expensive luxury. And this is a Betty lamp. This is why people went to bed early at sundown. Yes, indeed. Yes, uh, indeed. Because a little bit of grease was put in here. And uh, this, this is a spike. You could jab it into the barn. You could carry it around uh, like a lantern if you had to and mm -hmm. use it in different places. But they put a, a, a little rag and then whatever kind of grease they had handy. Well, I think we should see how life uh, did improve for people as the 19th century wore on and we learned to become consumers. So let's go to another house now that we have seen all the fascinating aspects of change in this house over 150 to 200 years. And let's see what the next generation was able to achieve. All right, let's do that. Well, Mary, here we are in a post-Industrial Revolution house, which I think will be really quite a change from what we've been looking at. and. Uh, I think that we're very fortunate in having a house that's in process, as it were, it's just beginning to be restored, so we can look at some of its old features and we can share some of the problems that are involved in, in restoring such a house to modern use. And you know what's really wonderful, this of course is, is what we call a Queen Anne Revival house, which is, uh, I, I like to, uh, to always say to my friends that the Queen Anne Revival is the first style created by inherited money. Uh, it's always easier to spend somebody else's money <laughs> instead of your own. But what's wonderful about it is that not only uh, can people afford things uh, that are more intricate, but in fact, uh, the commonplace has already become boring. So that now in a house like this, it's the, the, there's a search for the unusual. Look at this window. This is not the result of broken panes being replaced with inappropriate glass. This is exactly what this window was supposed to look like. There's a purple pane here and there's a pebbly pane there and different colors of green and so on because it would have been boring to have all the panes the same color. And this is what's wonderful about this sort of Victorianism, the love of, of clashes, of uh, outrageous decorative juxtapositions and so on. But I think that what fascinates me about a house like this and what fascinates people who, who move into houses like this, as this young couple is, has just done, is the fact that we see richness everywhere. We see trim uh, that is elaborate. Uh, it, it actually echoes uh, trim of the Greek Revival period, but in a far more intricate manner. We see marble fireplaces, which would not have existed, of course, in, in any of the earlier things. Everything we've seen so far has just been wood. But here we see all this marvelous gusto that I think appeals to us again today uh, in a very real way. It's interesting that during the, the Depression, when people lost their gusto for practical reasons, this kind of architecture became very unpopular. But now that we have gusto and in in, in interest in living and in a sort of almost sybaritic revival again, we're looking at Victorian architecture and enjoying it so much. Well, Hi, Mary, this is... It's this good. is really marvelous. Good to see you. This is a nifty radio. That is still a nifty radio. Yes, it still that, is. That but still I have works. many, I have many fond memories of radios like this. <laughs> well, I guess that that memories enter into 
the decision that's been made here, and I think it's a most wonderful decision. There are really only two ways to deal with modern spaces within old houses. One is to give them the character of when that kind of a space was created, which is what's been done here. The other, of course, is to do something very modern, which is far more commonplace. But I am just blown away by the wonderful, loving way in which a turn-of-the-century kitchen has been recreated here that has all the comforts of a kitchen of today. Uh, let's look at some of these things because I think they're great. I mean, here is a fabulous stove. A stove like this today, there is no money to buy. You can't get a stove of this quality. Even the best industrial stoves do, are not built with the quality of this old stove. And there is a company here in New England, and there are probably more than one, uh, that will take a stove like this and essentially modernize it so that you have everything from pilotless ignition to modern oven controls, but the actual stove is the real thing. And what a wonderful luxury. I mean, how many people in their kitchens have, you know, nine burners and uh, double ovens and everything uh, within this elegant, elegant package? You know, this is a, I mean, not only are there all these burners, there is even space to spare where you can take your kettle and take it off the burner. It's immense, you know, and it's wonderful. And this is just exactly the right thing to do in this kind of a kitchen. But let's look at details. Let's look at the loving way this has been done. The wonderful plate rail going around with this wonderful collection of, of older and newer things, which is exactly what the plate rails were for. They were for all of those things that you you reached and yet found decorative. The wonderful loving way in which a sink has been done with turned legs, with period cabinet uh, hardware, which is just absolutely delightful. Uh, because of the fact that we have an open sink the way they would have had then, there is no room to put the Ajax, but lo and behold, if we open this cabinet, here in a very convenient way are all of those wretched things that we must have at the kitchen sink. But you I'll are going to tell me... i secret. Exactly. You're going to tell me who is going to live with a sink without a dishwasher. Well, the dishwasher is here. It just happens to open on the side so that we don't see an ugly dishwasher to interfere with us. But actually, that's a splendid place to put it. You can be standing here and slipping things in the dishwasher, and it's absolutely wonderful. What else do we need today that people didn't need in 1900? Well, yeah. refrigeration, Refrigerators, of the most important thing. We live with refrigerators. People did have, of course, in the early 20th century, ice boxes, and this house had a particularly fine ice box. Uh, but now this particularly fine ice box has become its successor, the refrigerator. And uh, the whole thing's been done, so it's perfectly convenient, as convenient as any refrigerator in any kitchen, and yet it retains this marvelous turn-of-the-century character. Again, we have the same beaded boarding, which is virtually the theme of all turn-of-the-century kitchens, and we see it again in every side of the room. Well, we should look, of course, at that other very important element of houses, which is bathrooms. Right, right. <laughs> and we've so got to take a look let's just look outside at, the absolutely. kitchen door. <laughs> <laughs> so let's do that. <laughs> Well, Mary, after all, here it is. This is the, the real ice box that we've uh, uh, copied in doing the refrigerator. Uh, it had to be out here because when you brought the ice, you didn't come into the house. You just opened the door on the outside and put the block of ice in and left. Uh, the same thing was done with milk deliveries. Uh, but the real thing is still here, and as a matter of fact, it too has a significance in the 20th century because the various compartments are now being used for recycling, something that we have only recently begun to realize the importance of. This house has uh, still its uh, original privy, a two-holer. Uh, most American middle-class houses did not have plumbing until uh, well into the 20th century. Uh, probably 1915, 1920 is a good date for the first uh, permanent toilets in, in American middle-class houses. So when this house was built, this was it, but it was a lot better than going outside in the middle of winter. Well, here is the first real bathroom in the house, and 
This probably dates to the turn of the century or just after, and its restoration has begun, as we can see, and uh, I think eventually it'll be just as excellent as the restoration of the kitchen. What's interesting here is not just the, the new old woodwork, but the fact that we do have a most excellent uh, original marble sink. Uh, this will need cleaning, of course, and it will need appropriate faucets, uh, but it is a marvelous example of a turn of the century uh, uh, marble sink. Even the most elegant Victorian houses only had one bathroom, of course, and today we're used to a higher degree of comfort. So if this house is to be beautifully restored, it will need this particular compromise to be made and bathrooms to be added. How do you like this, Max? Well, Mary, you've anticipated everything that I was going to say. Isn't this a lovely room for a new bathroom? When, with, with these old houses, what we look for is a small bedroom that isn't really good as a bedroom, but which on the other hand is much bigger than any modern bathroom we would normally design. So this is just a perfect, perfect room for a, for a bathroom. Now, one way to go about it is the way that you've already done. It's a beautiful clawfoot tub. It's original. Uh, we could certainly have this kind of a tub in, in this room and it would be a wonderful bathroom with period fixtures. But imagine, if you will, given the fact that this is a completely separate room and we can close the door, imagine, if you will, a wonderful beaded board, dark oak platform here with gracious steps coming up to it and a marvelous jacuzzi and windows that look to three different directions, all this light coming in and change this, either put cafe curtains so the neighbors don't get too interested in your bath, or else we could actually make all these windows into stained glass or faceted glass, which would be absolutely glorious. Let's see what happens in a few years. I think we have to come back here at least once a year and, and see how it all goes.